Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for being here this evening with our conversation uh, with Giants. I am Barbara Johnson, Executive Vice President and Provost, and I am going to uh, provide some brief introductions of our guest and then also introduce our moderator for the evening. So I won't be up here long. I will first introduce uh, Ms. Nikki Finney. She is a 1979 graduate of Talladega College. She is also a native of Conway, South Carolina. That's where she was born. And I'm a native of North Carolina, so we're kind of close there. Yeah. Um, after she left uh, Talladega College, she had a very exciting career. I'll just give you a few of those highlights. She spent 23 years at the University of Kentucky as a poet and professor, as a Guy Davenport Endowed Professor of English. She was also a visiting professor at Berea College, which is in Kentucky, and Smith College. She has uh, written six books, edited another book, and in 2011, she was a National Book Award. She won the National Book Award for Poetry. And this um, is indicated uh, by John, NBA host John Lithgow as the best accepted speech ever for anything. <laughs> this legendary speech is on display in the inaugural exhibition of the African American Museum of History and Culture in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And if you are going to D.C., you will find this uh, speech in the Poets' Corner directly across from Chuck Berry's 1973 Apple Red Cadillac. <laughs> and so there you go with that. So yes, we definitely have great giant here. And um, if, in addition to the book she's written before, she has a new book out this decade. Um, it is called Love Child's Hotbed of Occasional Poetry. You get yours now. And uh, currently, in her home state of South Carolina, she involves herself in the day to day battles uh, for truth and justice while also guiding both undergraduates and MFA students at the University of South Carolina, where she is a John H. Bennett Jr. Chair in Creative Writing and Southern Letters with appointments in both the Department of English Language and Literature and the African American Studies Program. She continues to be an advocate for social justice and cultural preservation. Ms. Nikki Finney. We have with us our next uh, guest, Giant. We have with us Carla F.C. Holloway, Ph.D., MLS. She is a James B. Duke Professor Emerita of English and Professor of Law at Duke University. Professor Holloway is former Dean of the Humanities and Social Science Faculty at Duke University. She is an A.B. Uh, she holds an A.B. from Talladega College 
class of 1971. She has an MA from Michigan State, a MLS from Duke University School of Law, and she holds a PhD from Michigan State University. Her research and teaching interests focused on African-American literacy and cultural studies, bioethics, and law. She is the co-founder of Duke University's John Hope Franklin Center for International and Interdisciplinary Studies and its Humanities Institute. She has published eight academic books, and her published public scholarship focuses on appearances at, for MSNBC, MBR, and co-eds, excuse me, in newspapers across the country. She is a recipient of national awards and foundation fellowships. Her debut novel, A Death in Harlem, a historical fiction, was released in fall 2019 and was followed by Gone Missing in Harlem in 2021. And she just completed her third novel, The Thursday Lady. So join me in welcoming Ms. Dr. Carla Galloway. And last but definitely not least, we have Dr. Gregory J. Vincent, the 21st president of Talladega College, who will serve as the moderator this evening. And um, without further ado, I will hand the mic to you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for that, uh, for those very kind introductions. It is a joy to be here this evening. Um, I hope you all are just taking this in. One of the things you heard me talk about in, in my presentation is that you gotta center yourself and kind of recognize where you are, recognize the moment, right? And we have two of the uh, world-renowned scholars, poets in the world sitting here, sitting with us this evening, and they share a love of Talladega College, their alma mater. And I don't know about y'all, but I am psyched. I am so excited about being here. Can we give a round of applause? <laughs> you know, I, I, I brag on Talladega and say, I'll put my top 10 against your top 10. And we can even leave off Coach Primetime, you know. And, you know, we can. Now nah, he's my, he's like my, my, my ace, you know. But I will tell you that uh, we have produced seventeen college presidents. Just think about Dr. Harvey alone, class of nineteen sixty-one. Just by my um, back in the envelope math, he impacted over two hundred thousand students over his forty-four years. At Hampton University. These two scholars didn't just show up at some of the most prestigious universities in the world, they showed out. And so this evening, we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about inspiration. We're going to talk about uh, um, just their experience here at Talladega. And uh, we are in for a real treat. So I'm gonna start with your journey to Talladega. So I'd like to know what caused you to, one, consider Talladega and ultimately choose to enroll. And I am going to start with Professor Finney. Hey everybody. How are you? So glad to see you. So glad to be in your presence tonight. I probably wouldn't be here if Michelle Williams hadn't called me on a cold, rainy day in South Carolina and invited me here and said, mentioned something I said six months ago, maybe it was longer than that. And she was like, we, we, need to, we need to have you here. I said, all you have to do is invite me. I've never said no to an invitation to come to Talladega. I just don't, sometimes I talk too much or I get a little, you know, say things might 
make people a little uncomfortable and they don't invite me back, but that's not going to happen tonight. <laughs> well, 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 maybe it will. <laughs> right, Beth? Right. Before I tell, before I answer Dr. Vince's question, I got to tell you this story. 1975, I'm 18 years old. I'm sitting in the back of this room that does not have red seats. <laughs> and another giant is on stage, Sterling A. Brown. Now, some of us may not know Sterling A. Brown, but let me just say, Sterling, Sterling Brown, to us, to our generation, was what Tupac Oh, now I got your attention? <laughs> was to another generation. He stood up here. So for me to be standing here, yeah, I'm just, it's Carla, crazy. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. But here is the reciprocity. Here is the circuitousness of being a Talladegan and doing your work and leaving here and going out into the world infused with excellence, brilliance, the desire to read, the desire to know, the desire to critique. Carl and I bounce this back. Every time we see each other, we just get goosebumps about what we have as a result of having been here. OK, so that this was is an origin. origin. This is an origin story. Yeah. So to be called a giant, we don't, that's not. We don't take that lightly. And my friend Delois Beck Cook, right there, <laughs> only seven English majors in our class. Wow. Right here. She knows what she means to me. Good to see you. See. Brilliant. She was far more brilliant than I was at the time. Worked far harder on stuff than I did. Could quote literature and English five times as 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 deep. And we would sit out in Foy Bowl. Nobody knows what Foy Bowl is anymore. But we would sit out in Foy Bowl and have the most stimulating intellectual conversations that I ever had in my life. Okay, now to the question. <laughs> Mr. McRae, John McRae, who was a legendary, if you look up John McRae and, and South Carolina and black newspapers, you will find John McRae's name stamped across that subject matter. Well, after he created, founded the black newspaper in South Carolina, he came to Talladega to be an admissions officer. My father and I rolled up to campus one day. We went to Fisk, we went to Talladega, we went to Howard. He said, I couldn't go to Howard because of Washington, D.C. And we went to another school. And when we came up on this campus, we went to Savory Library. And Mr. McRae knew the history of Talladega College like the back of his hand. Mm -hmm. I was already a little Black Panther in South Carolina. <laughs> I was already Afrocentrically inclined. I had an Afro. I had been stopped. Someone thought I was Angela Davis. You know, all of that. So when he took me, us into that library, and I looked up at the 40 foot murals. I said, Daddy, we don't have to go anywhere else. I want to learn how to be a poet right here. Wow. In this history, in this Alabama, in this place that has cherished the Black experience in America and has put it on display. And for the next four years, I sat under those murals under Hale Woodruff's grand strokes, beautiful strokes, and learned how to become a poet. We're going to talk more about that tomorrow for all the students who are going to come to the, to, the, to the party we're giving in the morning, OK? But that's how I got here. Did you come here knowing that you were going to be a poet? No. I didn't know how to be a poet. Who has a poet in their neighborhood? <laughs> <laughs> Nurses, carpenters. Uh -huh. A lawyer here and there, a pharmacist here and there, a poet? I was always outside the lines. Yeah. Right, Beth? Right. <laughs> it was interesting you talk about your radical history because I had the, I, me and another student, Liz Mitchell, came back from our spring breaks, our 
freshman year with the first Afros on campus. <laughs> and um, they were not well received. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, we were pulled, we were pulled. We kind of looked the life when we visited to had the most glorious soprano voice. And she always sang the solos in the chapel. Whenever I was mistaken for her, I said, oh yes, that was my solo. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't. But we had those short, curly Afros at the time. And I remember um, holding up the, I had a table in the Union building about against the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. against, um, you know, enrolling in the service to go to the war. And so I was already on the list before I got involved in SNCC, which I did on this campus, because on this campus, we sat up and listened to um, Stokely Carmichael, not then Kwame, Kwame Ture, tell us how beautiful black women looked in gold and African gold was ours. And I said, well, of course, you know, like, you ever see a brown body with gold? Right. And I said, yes, you know, so he had convinced us all, you know, to get our passports. Right. This was this was the years of revolution. Um, this was when the Orangeburg massacre mm -hmm. happened. So when the takeover of the um, administration building here happened, led, I don't know if you know this, by Trustee Holloway, um, <laughs> my husband now, now president of the Alumni Association, <laughs> <laughs> um, circles. Um, we were locked into that administration building. Actually, I wanted to, to, to uh, you actually, that's a great lead into another question I want to ask you. So okay. if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you, 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 you were here from year 67 to 79. To 71. 71. Well, oh. to 70 to 79. Oh. Yeah. Talk talk about that time. We know you were getting into it, but talk about that time where of social unrest and, yeah. and protests and social justice. What was it like on this campus from sixty seven to seventy nine? Well, I, I thought you told me not to talk about stuff that people didn't want to hear about. <laughs> but see, that's what makes a good president. He opened the door. Well, this was a conservative school. Seriously. It was seriously black conservatism. Absolutely. But, but there were places and pockets that students organized thoughtfully, critical minds. That's what we have to talk about. Do you have a critical mind? Are you just on Twitter doing something? Or are you organizing your fellow students because you believe something in your heart and you want to follow through. Right. Snick, Snick, yeah. You know, Stokely Carmack was telling, I, I'll never forget this, it's in one of my books. He, he said, okay, now the meeting is over. Go home and tell your daughters they're beautiful. Yeah, way back. And, and the, it's an interesting thing, because that goes back to the, and it was opening this question. My parents met at Talladega, which is why I am here. Um, my mother from Detroit, Michigan, my father from Buffalo, New York, met on this campus. They went to school in the 40s, the same um, four years that my husband's aunt and uncle who raised him, matriculated and met at Talladega. So when it came time for me to tell them it was not that boy, but another boy that I was talking to, they said, oh, we know his people. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so that kind of family connections, which you will, it can be a legacy in so many ways. I found out going through papers that my great grandfather was somewhere at Talladega in the 1904-05. So I still haven't been able to, to trace his tracks, but I saw his name. So my, my history of Talladega goes way back. But what we each did with our stories when we came here, Talladega allowed, even in its conservatism, I would argue because of its conservatism, to push us to think about, okay, did you want to sit here at this table uh, where the Navy ROTC officer was trying to enroll and I was trying to disenroll students? And where did I get that attitude from? But my father really wanted to, I did not send you to that school. You know, to run a protest. <laughs> well, don't, you, don't you also think, though, even though the school was conservative in its, you know, approach sometimes, there were strategic professors who encouraged individual thought, yeah. 
uh, and, and pushed it in, a, in an intellectual discourse kind of way, not in a subversive, well, maybe it was a little subversive. <laughs> I think they, they, they were being uh, under underlying subversive. Yeah. We also had faculty back then who were here because they had escaped the uh, Nazi Germany. Right. Yeah, so if they were here because I mean, these were white professors who were um, European Jews yes. who ended up at Caladiga mm -hmm. and being here, talk about, I wonder how much our own, you know, pushback came from under, and they told us their stories. That's where I think right. the subversion came. Well, let me just tell you how I got here, right. you know, from their own form of underground railroad. They understood Mm -hmm. um, something about struggle intimately. Right. And so I think mm -hmm. the model of having those folks here in our midst being as serious about us as um, the black, the, they didn't, the black professors did not take any, any reason to say that you could not. One of the things my father told me, it came down to choosing between Talladega, I'm trying now the name escapes me, but it's one of those North, Eastern schools in Vermont, Burlington, no, somewhere in Burlington, Vermont. Okay. You know, um, so I would have been up in the snow in Vermont or down here in the sun in Caledonia. So it made sense for me to come here. But um, when he told me, "You will have four years of your life where you will not have to think about whether or not something is happening to you because you are black. Okay. You know, you are. You will just learn about excellence. You will learn about critique." You will learn how to receive critique, and nobody will say you did this because you were black. I grew up in a very integrated neighborhood, I went to a, a Unitarian church. And I think that this experience of Talladega was my chance to become the person that my parents were striving to be the exceptional Negroes. But there was something my daddy knew that I was missing. And he said, here's, here's your chance. And I think I can tell now a confidence of an HBCU student mm -hmm. because they don't, they don't think something's happening. They think something's the matter with you if you question their, you know, why they should be there. What, you, what do you mean I don't belong in this class? I remember um, many a class. Um, I was accepted into graduate school despite having high GRE scores. Um, provisionally, and I asked them why provisionally. They said, well, we never heard of your college. Did you write papers there? I was an English major. I said, what, what, what? You know, what did you think I was doing in Talladega? Um, so I had no doubts about capability. And that's because Talladega, in those years of protests, which I think were unique years, pushed us. I remember that I wanted to take um, astronomy. I was a black girl who liked to look at the sky. I still am. But there was no astronomy class at Talladega. And I remember figuring out that even though I couldn't take a class in astronomy, that my instructors had given me the wisdom to go and find out about the sky on my own. Yeah, Professor Finney, that, that is uh, the, the greatest example of a liberal arts education, yeah. which leads me to, I have a question for both of you. So this, this question's tailored for you. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your early life as a Black Panther. I mean, that's not the question. That's not the question. But, but so, so, so from, uh, as, as referenced by Dr. Johnson, from um, your National Book Award speech, that iconic speech. She said that what a professor told you haunts every poem, poem you make. And quote, black people were the only people in the United States ever explicitly forbidden to become literate, end quote. Please reflect on that. If you're not writing down some of this stuff, I see I was a scribbler. I, had, I always had a notebook in my hand and I was like, okay. <laughs> Dr. Katie Cannon. Dr. Katie Cannon said that, those are her words. She said, Nikki, do you know that black people were the only people who explicitly
innocently were kept from being literate? And I, I said, now what did she mean by that? Black codes. South Carolina, 1839. If you're caught with a book, we'll take your right eye out. Or we'll take your right hand off. Or we will kill you. What does that tell you about the power of literature? The power to be and write and think critically? The people who thought they had, were masters, who thought they were enslaving a people here in Alabama, <laughs> here in South Carolina, here in the South, said, don't you? Dare read a, uh, learn how to read. Why? Because you will want more. You get a little bit, you will want the whole test. That's what I tell my students. Don't come in my don't come in my class to play. Before you walked people with one eye and three fingers and two toes who wanted to read a book. Don't tell me you've never read a novel. Shame on you. Don't you be proud of that. That's not anything to be proud of. I come from people who died for the access to knowledge. Talladega College is a beacon and an artifact and an institution that has that history. People came into these doors with chickens to say, I'll give you this chicken if you teach me how to read. I got these eggs in a basket if you'll teach me arithmetic. <laughs> That's not so far away. We are not so far removed from that. Don't believe the, don't believe the cool, don't drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> Our grandmothers and grandfathers and great, great, great grandmothers didn't always talk about that. Why? Because they didn't want you to go through the way with them. They were trying to protect us from what they went through. But we still need to know those stories. We still need to hold that close as we sit in our lonely uh, rooms and at our desks and, and work for that aid. Work to leave here fully ensconced in the power of the intellect, and as my grandmother would say, the belly. Because she said, you think with two things on your body. You think here, in the books you read, because I'm a book girl, but she said, you also have to make decisions with here, with your belly. She said, you'll see a car pull up, and I said, come on, Nikki, get in. Let's go for a ride. No, my belly said, that's not a good thing to do right now. Mm -hmm. Do you think with your belly? You must. Which is appreciating your body. You know, part of this is, is not only the, the reason that Professor Finney's um, speech is so important is not in your uh, being able to read it, but when you heard it. So one of the histories here is the history of our words, the way we are taught, you know, what, what we kept as black folk, even when we were not allowed to read, was a practice of elocution, of being careful about language, about making our words matter, which is why, you know, that speech resonated, not that somebody was sitting down reading it, because she spoke it from her belly. And so one of the things, one of the histories of black culture, one of the things that makes me different at Talladega is being able to nurture the history of words as black folk, knowing that when we could express ourselves, we did it through language and we were careful about it. This is why poetry is so important because um, Professor Finney does word work. She labors over those words, even when I'm writing. I labor over a sentence. My husband tells me, your, your sentence, is, you, I mean, you write so it sounds good. Well, you know, what is language, but, but in our sound. So the word work that you have accomplished is the accomplishment of a culture of people who were denied the book. So once we got the book, we flew. But before we had the book, we communicated and it was in the rhythms of our dance, in the movement of our body, in the ways we sang to our babes. And when that, we got the chance to write that down, it sounded and felt different. 
because that's the expression of a black culture. Somebody told you to take away a book, do that. It's like banning a book. Well, I want to read that. Right. You know, what hurts me so much, um, Kanye West's mother was an English professor. Donna, I knew her well. Um, and so when Kanye, I, did, I, I think now I just, you know, just lost her. Yeah. But he said he, he didn't like to read. Yeah. Well, Professor, Professor Holloway, I, I want to get to your question, but I just want to take a moment for, for everyone in the room. Game knows game. Well, you know, to, to hear you, this distinguished scholar, Professor Holloway, he, he prays on your fellow talented. That, that's what it's all about. Um, don't get so big where you can't praise and, 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 and love um, others. Uh, so you, 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 um, that that that's powerful. That's powerful. So thank you for that. Yeah. Oh, Talladega Secure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Professor Holloway, in your uh, masterwork bookmarks. You ask, what are you reading? What books have been important to you? What does your response to those questions say about you? Where are you protected and where are you protected in isolated spaces for reading? Please reflect on that. Can I say first why I asked that question in bookmarks? Because there's a history of black letters. Um, still, when we started writing, of having to prove ourselves. Well, I've read, um, even if people a generation ahead of me would say, well, Shakespeare. And um, the Bronte sisters, of course, you know, and we we'd name all the famous white writers. And if we were trying to be sad, we might slip in a black guy, James Bond, and Johnson, you know, something yeah. like that. But our our stature seemed to be achieved by listing books written by white folks. I've read all the classics, um, but when I wrote that, I was really reflecting on what made me as like you, a reader, um, someone who found um, sanctuary. Mm, good word. Good word. Good word. That's the space where I went, where I go today to be left alone. And there was a rule for my children when they were growing, when they were youngsters: um, don't disturb a reader. And you, so if you're reading a book, you didn't have to do the dishes. You didn't have to. Now one of them got it. One of them didn't. I have to say. One of them said, "Oh, I figured this out." You know? <laughs> and, but the idea I wanted them to know how important it was for me to give them that security. And today I have an eight-year-old grandson. I can tell what he's reading by how he's talking, you know, or what he's talking about. Uh, or who he wants to be on Halloween. You know, it was a dragon this year, so he's into all of the, the dragon books. You know? And I think that's wonderful for an eight-year-old to have that kind of imagination. But I was writing that, thinking about the space of safety that was yet to be um, taken away. And interestingly enough, it was given, as Professor Finney says, you know, we, we had to be given the book, the permission to read. We had to move up, move up side those codes that took away books. And now I find that the security and the sanctuary and the silence that can come just by turning the page. You know, I do read on a Kindle sometimes, but I came here with a book in my hand. Um, I, I'm kind of playing today. I, and per, um, Pernock, the, um, the Egyptian, uh, British Egyptian who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, uh, his book, Paradise. Um, so I still like that, that movement of the page takes me to that space yeah. in those, you know, I also wrote in bookmarks about the tables in the Savory Library. Interesting how that space for both of us, you know, um, the murals and then looking down at the outside. And now us knowing fully the story of that um, slave ship. And I, you know, I am one of those who uses words. I, you know, I'm on the Twitter, 
you know, so, and, and I did my own Tower Geek of hosted a Monday motivation. Um, I love them, whoever's doing those Monday motivations. But I noticed that this my last Monday's motivation was posted over the um, image of CMK slaughtering everybody. <laughs> you know, and I said, are you sure about it? That's, that's the background you're going to use for this wonderful motivational statement you're making. So, yes, I can, I can be critical of our alma mater. This is where I learned how to be critical. But the important thing is that we are offering that uh, that space up for readers to either notice what's up, what's underneath the picture of the slaughter um, as a Monday motivation, which I, I just thought was joyous, you know. Uh, but I'm sure we were just using the opposite murals. But it's in that paradox, in that space of uncertainty, in that space of critical interpretation, you can go this way, you can go that way, that I found um, a reader's space. So when I wrote bookmarks, I was interested in noting how books can offer you, and words, can offer you an alternative space that is nobody would pay from. You know, that's there for your absorption. Um, that's there for you to nourish. That's there for you to play with language is very playful. Um, that often split to do that. So that playfulness but the, I love that book. Thank you. Um, the idea that word work will be your link to your space in history, as well as the key to your personhood in this century. So how you use your words. You know, our parents use your words, you know, not your name, not your fist, or you know, kick your, bite your brother or sister, or whatever they were talking about. But using your words is a gift that um, I think I'm gonna have for a good long time. Other things be failing me these days, but I can still just some word for it. That's beautiful. I, I, I am, you both alluded to it, but I want you both to spend some time to talk about the impact of the Amistad murals on, on you as students and as scholars and what it means to the larger world. I had an uncle, Jamie, Los Angeles, California, who began when I was 15 to, to teach me, basically, you know, just kind of sitting on the couch during holidays what the world wanted to keep from me yeah. about being black. Yeah. He kept dropping these like factual things in my lap that he didn't know if they were gonna stick or not. He didn't know if it was, you know, would matter to me. And he would just start talking about, here, read this James Baldwin essay. Here, read this Toni Morrison. Uh, look what Toni Morrison wrote after she won the Nobel Prize about language and about the language. We're living in a moment right now, right now, where people think they can say whatever they want with no consequences. And my students are befuddled about what is the truth. If you go to Toni Morrison's essay and look at what she says about three pages in about what Carla is saying right now about word work. You, you begin to think critically about who is saying what to you and why. Yeah. And why? Why this whole discussion is going on now about who leads Twitter and what is gonna be coming out on that format for the world, not the country, the world. 300 million people will begin to take this in, right? And so you have, it's your responsibility, if you're gonna be here and not just be for you, but be for something bigger than you, which is what my parents taught me. And what Taladita taught us. And what Taladita taught us, you've gotta be for more than just yourself. Yeah. If it's two people, fine, but it's more than you. And that I have never lost. I have never lost that desire to, to do the Harriet Tubman and bring somebody with me. That's right. 
I am not here by myself. Mm -hmm. I stand on the shoulders of others. Mm -hmm. Learning my history means I am never without clothing. I am never without word work. I am never without understanding of who I am. Therefore, when somebody confronts me wrong or comes in my face in a wrong way, I don't have to pull out a gun. Mm -hmm. Hello? <laughs> Hello? You hear me? We used to fight fist to fist. Get up out the dirt and say, I'll see you at dinner. Now we do this stupid thing. We buy this stupid thing and it's decimating our communities. Who do you think put that gun in our communities? Hello? How did I get on that subject now? Because I am telling you, they people in charge do not want you to make a good decision. So think about the Amsterdam bureaus like that. Think about how we, when we took charge of that shit, Amistad, um, there was a purpose in that violence. There was a purpose for those men in that courtroom. And they understood the purpose of their being sitting up. I, I just remember freedom. when, yeah, freedom, freedom, you know, sitting up straight there. And then Hale Butcher painting himself into that courtroom scene. That's the one that, that caught me. So, well, you can do that. Well, hey, Carla, well, look how we're doing. Yeah. So that picture that's on the, the Monday page of just the the the, Monday, uh -huh. the, mm -hmm. the massacre, mm -hmm. that's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. There you go. And when you think critically, you go, well, wait, what's the rest of the story? Okay, some people died. Some people had to die. But then freedom, courtroom, mm -hmm. the whole thing begins to unravel in a cinematic way in front of your eyes. Don't just stay on the massacre. If you have a critical mind, you want to know more. You know, and truth to tell, that's why late in life, I was 55 when I went to law school. And, uh, I mean, it was hard to be the stupid. <laughs> what is the matter with you sitting up there? I had a little baseball cap on, hiding my gray hair. You know, and, um, and the, the teacher goes along, the first thing he does is say, let's ask some people why they're here. And then points to me the first thing. and. I went literally to law school because I wanted to know how they thought. You know, I knew how I was trained to think as an English professor and a humanist. And I knew I could go read law myself. I think I could read the Constitution like anybody. But I wanted to know how are you lawyers, how are you doing that interpretation where you can leave out all of this other stuff that I know is also true? So in learning the master's tools, mm -hmm. um, then you'll be able to do something with that house or that shit. You know, one of the things Tony Morris said about racism is it's a distraction. Yeah. Don't let that get in your way. Is racist somebody calls you some word and, and then you have to go about proving, oh no, we can think. Um, we don't have to measure our heads. I forget that wonderful passage where she explains racism as a distraction when our response is to go and say, oh, no, 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 I am human. I, I am just like you when you go down this path, when they take you away from the path that you were on. Don't be distracted. That's what the Amistad taught me. Don't get distracted. But we your purpose. We can do this all day. I'm gonna, I have one other question. I'm going to open it up to the audience. One of the things that I share with children, my mentees, is that you have to have a board of directors. You need people that are mentors, sponsors, and ambassadors. Can you share who's your board? Whose boards do you serve on? And how have you been mentored? How have you been sponsored? How have you served as an ambassador? Share both about your journey and how you've done, done both of those things, being um, being hooked up and then also opening doors for others. Great questions, Dr. Vincent. I, I, I want to answer by, by saying don't be distracted by the, by the term board of directors. Dr. Vincent would have a board of directors. This poet wouldn't have a board of directors. But no, but we, we're still doing the same work. So the, what I'm saying is don't don't get off track with, by the title. Yeah, yes. Right. Yes. Because each of you has a board of directors. That's right. I 
that's what I want to make the connection for. Because sometimes we don't think that we have to change the word work mm -hmm. so that we that you know that I am about to tell you a story that I think has to do with you. Lorraine Harmon, physical education teacher at Talladega College for a long time, died of breast cancer right here, mm -hmm. buried in that cemetery that I blew a kiss to when I came across that bridge. Mm -hmm. Graduation day, she took my hand and she said, Nikki Finney, mm -hmm. don't you take any wooden nickels in this life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she left and I never saw her again. Mm -hmm. I went home on in that car thinking, what nickels, Carla? <laughs> what wooden, wooden nickel? Wooden, never heard it before? Mm -hmm. And never forgot it. Yeah. She's on my board of directors. Okay, because she set a seed inside me that said I had to figure out, oh, I'm going to look in my hand anytime somebody gives me something. Yeah. And I'm going to make sure that what they are giving me is what they say they are giving me. I want to be, and this is another word for the night, discerning. Don't you believe something just because it came off social media? Bring your heart in your head and look at that and say, oh, wait, they still keep, they are still trying to keep me from knowing how to read a book, from knowing how to think critically, from knowing how to do this equation on my own. You have to be wanting and willing not to wait for even a teacher from Talladega. You gotta go in the library and figure it out yourself. Second, second answer to this question that Dr. Vincent mentioned in that speech when I won the National Book Award. The other scene is I'm sitting on the wall with my girls. It's a Friday night. The cues are about to throw down. I have finished my papers and I'm going to go to this party because I love to dance. <laughs> Fill up there. I see Dr. Gloria Wade Gills coming across the campus. I'm her mentor, mentee. I said, oh, no, don't let Dr. Gales come up here right now and mess up my thing. I'm going to the dance. She always was like, Miss Finney, Miss Finney, have you done this? Can you do this? Have you read it? She stopped right in front of me. Two other sisters right over here. She doesn't even look at them. Miss Finney, have you read every book in Safety Library? They start giggling. I say, uh, no, Dr. Gales, I have not read every book in Safety Library. Well, I think you need to get off this wall and follow me, because that's what I'm getting ready to go do. Now, wait, here's the question. If I follow her, it's one decision that I make. And this is a decision for all of us. If I don't follow her, if I say, Dr. Gail, I can wait for this dance all week. I finished my studies. I, did my, I got my papers in. I'm going to go dance. How do you make that decision? I'm thinking critically. I'm thinking with my brain. I'm thinking with my belly. I know that if she, and she just turns and walks on that side, walk right there. It was that. She knows I'm going to follow her in that library because we work together. She knows I want to be a good writer one day. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> right? I stand in that library. Couldn't hear the cue party. I left at about midnight, went back to my dorm in Foster Hall. And I'm so glad I did. Because people who love you, your board of directors, will test you. Yeah. They will test you. And you have to be willing to let the party go in order to pass the test for the person who is on your board of directors. Dr. Gloria Wade Hill is on my board of directors. She's on mine. I remember. I, of all of the papers, as an English major, you will write, and all of the, the criticisms and comments that they will write. For some reason, when I wrote, we were assigned to write a sonnet, probably an Elizabethan sonnet or something, and she wrote on my paper, Michael, I, I'm 73 years old. How am I supposed to remember something that a teacher in Talladega told me? But she wrote, thank you for trying to do well a difficult assignment stays with me to this day because she appreciated my effort. She knew it was difficult and she knew I tried and she wanted me to know that she knew. She was watching me. So, you know, after that, I was going to try everything. 
um, to the best of my ability because something or somebody is going to notice. When you said board of directors, I, I've had the most formal ones from being on the college, I sat on the college board for a year until quite frankly, I saw what the college board did. And it was when they were trying to give AP credit to dance. I said, AP credit to dance? I, I love to dance too. But who, what students are you privileged who have dance class? And I realized what a commercial um, enterprise the AP, the college board is. And it's fine, you know, we'll run on commerce, but I want to be a part of that. So I wrote him a letter, thank you for letting me be on the board. <laughs> Understand now, I think you need to give this position to somebody else. I was on that board. I formed boards when I formed the John Will Franklin Center. But when you said board of directors, mine is my book club. 30 plus years of the same women. You know, some of us have changed. And, and I just came from the funeral yesterday of one who, um, one of the, the men of the, the husbands um, in the book club who died in his 80s. So you tell how old we are. But these are women who chose the prom dress for my daughter because I wanted her to wear you know, the frilly thing. And she had this little black slinky that she, the child is not going to a prom with this. And the book club said, yes, she is. And she got some heels. They chose her prom dress. They chose, you know, when, um, when my son was killed. And I could not move. They came over to the house because it was also her graduation packed a bag. I remember them. I didn't have my hair in locks and they were brushing my hair. I don't know what they put in the suitcase and they almost followed us to Princeton to, because she deserved the graduation she was going to have. And they made sure that I was together. They are today my board because they have kept me, put the pieces of me back together. Now boards of directors can be quite formal but they will always deal with the pieces of you, the pieces of buildings and grounds, the pieces of academic or whatever. You, know. you need all of those pieces. And you need somebody, we have a president being inaugurated this week, um, who's going to put it all together. But your boards might not be the folk that you think they are. It might be folk in your family who will call you up and pull you back from where you thought you were, remind you who your people are and who brought you up like this or not like that. So notice, you don't take every bit of advice you're given, but you pay attention to who you surround yourself with because that will tell you a lot. So did you want to surround yourself with the cues that night? I could understand oh, that the dance, you know, you know being in, in, in the parties at Talladega, that can be a mighty persuasion. But Carla, there was going to be another party. Yeah, yeah, and there will always be. But that was not going to have another opportunity to follow Dr. Gales into that library. But see, I bet you anything that you're thinking in that state as well, there'll be another party. Let me go with Dr. Gales. Your gut, your stomach, your heart told you a woman has issued me an invitation. Not just a woman. Yeah, a, an icon. You know, the, the, the giant who is sitting here. Not the giant. Yes. Dr. Gloria Wade Gales. Yes. When you talk about how many people have been touched by folks in our life, you know, her, I can't remember a darn thing any other person said to me on a paper, you know, but her words, thank you for trying to do well a difficult decision. She knew that was too hard for us to do, but she, you know, I, this assignment, and that was my assignment, that was, you know, my lesson, and I tried to do my lesson. Try to do your lesson. Try to figure out what your lesson is. Listen to the people who are giving you the lessons and discern whether or not they deserve work. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a time for a couple of uh, questions. And the mic is coming to you. Uh, good evening to you both. I know you both. Uh, Dr. Holloway, could you say more about your involvement in SNCC? Because you touched on it, but you didn't really, I, I mean, that, that was an important piece of your political um, activity while you were here on I, I 
still today don't want to say a whole lot. Let me say that I haven't ever, um, I used to leave campus to go to Birmingham where these, there was a SNCC headquarters. <laughs> At that time, I didn't realize that slow car following us down the street because I was with a man who was director of research um, for SNCC. And so we helped to gather up the research various offices around the country and um, distribute them to headquarters. But um, I, I did not tell you where anyone today where that house was because it was a sanctuary. And being um, invested in the SNCC was, and SNCC at that time, even though we call it student nonviolent, I'm going to move this away from that. No, it's not true. Okay. Um, student nonviolent coordinator committee. Um, the nonviolence is not a given. There was a day at Tahoeuga where there were assault weapons in the student in the faculty meeting. And the faculty was saying, yeah. I'm sitting up there as a student, as a student representative to the faculty. And they were in the, say, I'm not gonna sit here when there are this is during the agitation period of the seventies, when there are machine guns at the back, this was a, a group not associated with SNCC, but the FBI was looking for them. They were here. And I'm sitting up there just as dumb as it's, you know, rock saying, you know, what's wrong with the um, machine guns? You can't answer the question. You know, now as a grown up and a family member, I'm thinking, what the heck was I doing sitting in a room where, where there were machine guns? So there were a lot of contradictions in the snake movement. Um, what was necessary, though, was to see the power and the empowerment of black students in HBCUs across the country. It was actually founded at Shaw University in Raleigh, where I live now, um, in, in the research triangle. And to see, understand that we had an authority. We were young, we didn't quite know how to use it all. But it was noticeable to the federal government. I was going to say, I never uh, asked my FBI records because I know, you know. And frankly, you know, some, someday somebody might be interested in, in, in find out. But the work that we did, that I was proud of doing, was organizing um, a research arm instead. That we could not be independent, you know, bodies across the United States. Um, this research director was from Beaumont, Texas, a former Taliban, um, and who eventually had to leave the country. Um, and go to Denmark because the FBI was looking for him. I remember that summer getting a phone call from um, Denmark and my parents were saying, who's calling you from Denmark? And because um, they didn't know any of this involvement. But because I came to campus as an, an anti-war activist, this was a natural evolution for that activism to flow into something that I saw as empowering black students and giving us a space to uh, to unite that was not formalized in any other way in the country. You know, the, I think we used SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and I went to some of the, um, I went to the March on Washington and frankly saw the what I still call today, when I was coming from, in from Atlanta, seeing the Aberdanty Boulevard, and thinking, you know, there's some people my age who could say stuff about um, Reverend Dr. Abernathy that is terribly good and terribly bad, uh, because we were there in Tent City, you know, and so some of our heroes have been elevated by movements that were not organic. SNP was organic. And that's what I appreciated about it. About my work there, I, I've never written about it and never talked this publicly about it. Um, but it lasted for as long as the um, national research director lasted in the United States, which is about two years past that point before I graduated. He had had to leave the country. Thank <laughs> you.
question back here. Okay. 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 Hi. My question is, um, were there ever any times where you doubted yourself and you really expounded on it? Both of us? Sure. Um, I'm just, I, I don't know what you're asking the question. Both of you. Okay. Yeah. And say it one more time. Um, could you tell us about a time when you doubted yourself as a writer? Never. Never? <laughs> 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 That's so I doubt myself every day. I'm human. I go to that desk. I don't know what I'm gonna write. Part of the beauty of being a writer is surprise. I don't know where it's going. I'm not trying to write something that's already been written. Writing is an original act. So it's like, some days, it's like, it drives me crazy when people say, oh, I am writing a blog, I can't write today. Mm -hmm. I say, put your hand up. You see that hand? Oh, they look like you got four fingers at least, five fingers. They look pretty good. Some days you write poorly. Those are the days you know, and then the next day you write something and it's astounding and it surprises you. And the adjectives are there and the metaphor is perfect. But if you don't have the poor day to put next to the astounding day, what are you going to compare it to? Any runners in here? Some days you run. You can get around that track one mile is is is, is but the, the start is horrible. You know, your leg hurts, you drank too much beer the night before, but then you get into a what? A groove. Writing is like that too. Anybody play the trombone, the piano? You hit a bad note. You hit the bad note so that when you hit the good note. So don't be so hard on yourself. Being a writer, being an artist, being an original thinker is work. It's not an acorn that's going to hit you in the head when you walk across campus. You got to go to the desk. You have to have an idea. You got to be curious. You got to be discerning, and you have to want to create something. The power of being a writer is that every day I count my pages. How many pages you got, Nikki? I only did three today. I only did five today. Half of that, horrible. Too. But I sat there, but I did it. Of course, of course, you're going to feel like you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, just like every other human being in the universe. Stop being so hard on yourself. I'm not saying that you would ever feel this way, but if you did, pat yourself on the back, hug yourself. Yeah. You know, we, we, you live in a hard world, you live in a really tough world right now. And we all need to be tender. Tender is the word to to ourselves and to each other. That's it. Right. And, and, and part of what you're asking me, sister, is, and what do you do after that? Because of course, we all have moments. We have moments of self doubt. Um, make sure you give them to yourself, not that you take it out of what somebody has said to you. Because when you take in other people's critique. That's when you're doing yourself damage. But you do yourself well to have that doubt because it's a push for you. Oh, I wonder if this is good enough. I wonder if this is like what I wrote, what I did, what I accomplished, how I did at work, you know, whatever the job might be. So what do you do after you question yourself is the real issue here. And that is, and I keep going, and I take the next step. And be sure that that moment of pause does not come because somebody asked you, who do you think you are up in here? And you take it in. I mean, people are going to say that to you all the time in any way, you know, but what you do with that, whether you take it in or just say, mm -hmm, and move on because you're your own critic, you're your own success, and you are your own failure in whatever way you want to say, oh, I, that didn't turn out well, let me do something else. And you do it better or differently the next time. And Carla, in that library right back there are books and biographies of writers who always head down. Yeah. And when you read enough of those, you say, oh, wait, this is like a human thing to have down. It's not just me. But you got to read. Back to the reading. If you don't read, you don't know that, you know, for some reason. So you begin to accumulate the knowledge 
of world of what how writers do this thing. And don't be and go, it's at the library, it's not on the web. You know, it's, it's not in Google. You know, that's not where it's the stuff that you get get all the pages, you know. Um, and let that be your information. Be careful out there in that um, what is it, web web world, worldwide world, world web, because it's deceptive. Thank, thank you so much. We could do this all evening, uh, yet uh, we are going to reserve the last question for the person who keeps us safe and is also an international celebrity. I'm going to do this all day, Chief. I'm, I'm going to do it all day, Chief. <laughs> well, Chief, you, you have the last question. So I think you actually answered my question, but... Uh, I'll ask it again, maybe in a minute. When you experience these writer's blocks, how do you overcome it? What do you do in order to overcome? Here is this. Writer's block is a lie. That's it's right. a lie. It's a lie. Writer's block is a pause. You know, it means you need to stop and think. Or go read another somebody else's book. Writer, I mean, see, they invented these things that will make you stop your journey yes. self question yourself don't do that don't give it to that a block is oh i'm supposed to stop and, and have some reflection time because yeah. writing isn't you you know just do it every day and, and smoothly and fluidly writing is sometimes looking at the stars you know and thinking about this now i didn't see that one yesterday i wonder what's making me notice this today you, you know be, you would be amazed if you take certain things out of your oh, vocabulary, that doesn't exist. take things out of your vocabulary that have been planted in your vocabulary to harm you, to, harm you, to stop you, yes. to make you doubt yourself. If you could do that, you, I'm telling you, it took, it's taken me all, all of this gray hair. It doesn't just happen overnight. It is constantly assessing, assessing yourself as a human being to know that being a writer is a contract I make with myself. And that self that you have to nurture and pay attention to and take, and take care, care of. of because things happen to the self. That's right. You know, things happen. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I mentioned before um, my son's death. My son was killed. Um, I thought, where's the book? That tells me what to do now. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, you know, I'm going to the book. What chapter right. is grief in? Right. 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 You know, what what chapter is shame in? Right. Because you know, he was um, he was irredeemable mm -hmm. when he died, shot by police, and I was <coughs> yeah, it's it's an odd thing for a parent to say, but. I think his death was a saving to the life of other people that he would have earned. Um, it was a horror, but there was no book to tell me what to do. So I had better have my head already filled with information and a board of trustees who would come around me and the words to work through the tragedy because there was no book. And eventually, I see this one here passed on. African American morning stories. It's about death and dying. And, and eventually I got back and wrote that book very differently um, and put my son's story in it. Um, I had to write it out. There was no book, so I had to write it. Um, so don't, don't let the words stop you. Don't let the situation stop you. They are moments of grace to give you pause, to give your body pause, to let you stop. You know, um, take the blessings of of being stopped. Dr. Richard, can I just say one thing? You can say whatever you like. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just end with this. When I was at Talladega College, the thing that I discovered about myself had to be all the things I loved that I didn't know I loved. Yeah. Dr. Zare, Dr. Howard Zare. Hippie came in and taught us photography. I fell in love with photography. Who knew? 
they made us go to that chapel to see classical music played and listen to it. I was like, I don't want to go in that music chapel today. I fell in love with classical music. Why am I telling you this? Because the world wants to slot you in one direction. But when you have a liberal arts education, you have a canopy. I go into physics lectures to this day because I do not know physics. I'm terrible at math. And I want to see what it has to do with me. What do those numbers, I love the number seven. I don't know why. I'm going to work it into something I'm going to write about. You are not myopic. Take these things off and go into something that you don't know anything about. That's why you have a liberal arts education. And when anybody <coughs> comes in your face talking about, oh, you got it's only technology, it's only technology, oh, it's only science, it's only. No. You are a human being. You have spirit, you have intellect, you, you, you don't have to eat what everybody else eats while you are here. Be curious. Be curious. Let people laugh at you. Oh, you want to go in that place? You, you're not, you don't know anything about law? You don't know what I know. Feed your mind. What's the, what's the, what is the, what is the talent the college motto? Hmm. Hello? Head, heart, hand. You make something with your hand. You think with your head and you feel with your heart. How can you go have a college model and you don't even know what it is? Teach. No, don't wait to be taught. Lean into knowledge. Go up there and look at the seal and see what it says. Don't wait for a teacher. It's about notice. Come on, y'all. We love you. We leave it. We, leave it. we, leave it. we drop it. Everything we got, and I'm gonna tell you, don't let people slot you into one dimension. Be five dimensions. That's why you love physics. I love I'm it. sure there's something to be. There's something to be. <laughs> I haven't found it yet, but I'm gonna keep looking. I, I just want to end um, by just one thanking you, but just maybe going a level uh, deeper. Um, Professor Finney, we shared a little bit uh, about your family. And although this is the first time we got to formally meet, your father had a profound impact on me. The, the first African American to serve as the chief of the Supreme Court of South Carolina. Let that seep in for a minute. And just his words of wisdom to me, who was trying to follow in his footsteps. So I just wanted to, to uh, uh, just, 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 just to make that connection. Um, so, so thank you. To um, Professor Holloway, I think the most generous, loving thing you can do is open up your home. And for you and, and, and Trustee Holloway to open up your home, uh, so that I could meet some of the alums in the Triangle area with such an act of love and support. I just want to say thank you. I just want to say thank you. You could have had it somewhere, you know, you could have had it at some fancy club or, you know, but you, you, you opened your home. <laughs> <laughs> but you opened your home. And I just wanted to publicly say thank you for that. We were honored to have you there. And one of the things that I think well, I'll learn is that this Talavega community um, extends beyond the space we are in right now. It extends beyond this time, you know, whatever, 2022, November, back 12th November. Right. Um, I remember my grandson the other day was laughing to somebody. I had sent him a picture and they thought it was his birthday and he laughed. Oh, it's not my birthday. My birthday is in 20. I was born in 2024, no, 2014. And I said, well, you will have a birthday in 2024. He said, I will, won't I? And so the idea that there will be something beyond, notice that too, because you're not going to carry, you carry yourself wherever you go. And wherever you've been has the essence of that presence of having been there. Coming home to Talavega, 
is a spirit. This is a spirit space for us both. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. For wow. I, you know, um, I knew this was going to be a powerful, compelling moment to have two giants come back home <clears throat> to share their wisdom, their head, their heart, their hands with us. What an amazing gift. Can we all give our giants a moment? Professor Holloway, who talked about the uh, the physical act of, of turning the page, right? So if you'd like, there are, these amazing books are right here. If you just want to touch them, right? If you just want to, you can you can do uh, do that. But again, uh, this is just the first. This is the second day. Fourth day, eighth day of, of, of the week. Uh, it's been a long week. But I, I, I was inspired by something that Dr. Boyd said, and I'm just going to repeat it here. Um, she, she implored us to start with God, to stay with God and be successful in God. Today, we took a sacred visit to the grave site of our, our founder, William Savory. What a powerful moment. We heard the story, the testimony of Barbara Shore's class of 1966. Her father, along with like your father, were just pioneers and we're on the ground fighting for justice for all of us. It's just Tuesday, y'all. <laughs> Tomorrow is Spirit Week, some Spirit Day. Yes, President Holmes, why don't you come up here, please? There you go. One on one, but I don't want to leave here. If you got something you want to think about tonight, bring it tomorrow. Yes, Professor, I'm glad you said. I just want to remind everyone at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning in here, you can meet with Professor Fenny. And at 11 o'clock, you'll meet with Professor Holloway. Bring your notebook, bring your questions, your ideas, your thoughts, and spend more time with them. So tomorrow is about the students. Some of us have a trustee meeting uh, where you can tell really excited about that. Uh, much rather hang out with you all, but we got work to do. But no, we, we, but I am so, we are so fortunate to have a great board. We're gonna have a great meeting. But what I'm gonna do since tomorrow is spirit day, I'm gonna turn it over to the president of the student body, my partner in, 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 um, in this work, uh, Ashton Hall, I'm going to give the mic to you so you can make presentations on behalf of the college. Can we give a hand for <laughs> President Hall? Thank you, Dr. Vincent. I uh, truly want to thank each and every one of you for coming out this evening. Ms. Um, Holloway and Ms. Finn, I want to thank you guys for your words of wisdom, your expertise. Just share with us your experience that you have had from when you were most once a scholar here and the continued success that you guys have had in your lives. And we pray that you have more success and just more life abundantly um, as you continue your journey here on earth. So we want to thank you for your time here. We want to present you with these um, thank you gifts. We hope that you enjoy them. Show sure, yeah, that we love you. We appreciate you. We all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So just to remind everyone, we do have books for sale. And I think uh, Professor Holloway and Professor Finney have agreed to sign. No, not to this I really want you to sign it. Okay. 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 So, and, and you have, a, a, as a student tomorrow, perhaps you have an opportunity to get them signed if you come uh, at 10 and 11 to meet with them. But anyone else, we have books for sale outside. 
and some snacks for you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening.